What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming out, you another know, community shout back. Uh, Shoutcast for the OUSA Dota League Season 2. We're loading into game number one of the best of three series between Horseman the Ruckus and Momentum Dota. And I believe it's Momentum to have first pick. Horseman the Ruckus have chosen the Radiant side. It will be interesting to see what hero Momentum Dota decided to let through the first banning stage. Just waiting for the last play to load in. So Gats, <coughs> the four position player, or four or the five position, him and Method Man do switch it up from time to time, depending on what hero they are playing. And so we're loading into... Uh, game number one, Horseman the Ruckus currently undefeated in every single game of the Group 2 playoffs. Let's see if they can maintain their hot streak, led by their captain as well as their mid player, King Killer. And over a Momentum Dodo. I believe it's their mid player, let's get it. And it will be interesting to see what hero he's decided to ban out. He actually goes for a first ban on the Tidehunter, so usually, uh, Tidehunter, if you don't have first pick, you uh, ban out the Tidehunter just because he's currently the most powerful offlane hero in the uh, current meta game, but if you do have first pick, you actually usually let Titan slip through, since you could pick him up. But Momentum Dota, I guess they're not too confident with their Tidehunter, and so that does mean that the Faces Void is going to slip through the draft. And Momentum Dota, they might want to pick him up as their first pick, although we have been seeing a lot of Shadow Shaman. He seems to be the most uh, common first pick so far in the ODL 2, just because of the versatility he gives you, since not only is he excellent with the uh, crowd control as well as the damage that he can provide through the Aether Shock, the Mass Serpent Wards is a great way to, for you to be able to take team fights and the take towers which seems to be the current trend with the uh, emphasis on 5-on-5 five five early engagements and taking objectives very quickly and utilizing that small advantage to be able to uh, gain the control of the game and try to end the game before the enemy team kind of starts to come online. So Lycan Throat first ban coming up from Horseman the Ruckus as well as the Doom. So very standard bans coming up from them. Momentum Dota instantly pick up the Faces Void but the Tinker is still in the pool and Horseman the Ruckus King Killer, he does like to play a very active early game Tinker where, you go, where he goes for 3 points in the laser march. Uh, three points of laser missile, opting only to stick with two points in the march, so that lets him rotate and create a lot of space. He did go for a much more uh, old school build on the tanker, so two points in laser, then missile, then shooting to max out the march. And so that was because it gives him a lot more flexibility since it enables him to be able to defend himself if he gets ganked, and it also gives him uh, enough damage to be able to uh, participate in ganks as well as to defend himself against them. But usually the common build for the tanker, especially if you're going for the farming tanker, is two points of laser, then you max out March with a rearm at six. But Invoker first pick coming up from Horseman the Ruckus, most definitely going to be a Quas Exalt Invoker, just because Quas Wex Invoker, while still is very powerful with the Tornado EMP combo, it just isn't viable in the laning stage. And Invoker's a very greedy mid. Since he plays like a semi-carry, you have to draft your entire team around him, and you have to have an excellent uh, Invoker player. So King Killer most likely going to be the Invoker player. We also have been seeing Invoker as a safe lane farmer, IG. Love to do this because it gives you a lot of flexibility. In regards to what your supports do, since your supports, they can uh, babysit Invoker for the first 3-4 levels. Once he gets 2-3 points up in the Exalt, you can leave him alone because he's got enough base damage to be able to uh, out-CS the offlaner once he's left alone. And with the Cold Snap, as well as the Forge Spirit up, he can actually do a fair amount of harassment damage. And Invoker, if you go for the Exalt build, especially the safe lane, you can participate across the map just with the Global Sunstrike. But Invoker up against the Faces Void, you usually see the two picked up in tandem, since Faces Void can set up a very easy Sunstrike with the Chronosphere. But Invoker most likely going to be run in the mid lane by King Killer. He usually is successful in being able to secure uh, lane control. Just because Invoker is a very greedy hero, so you need a huge amount of gold and experience. So that's the drawback of running him as a safe lane farmer, is it ensures the gold, but it doesn't necessarily ensure you the experience. The supports have to hang around for the first few levels. And the Weaver, second pick coming up from Momentum Dota. So going for the Faceless Void in conjunction with the Weaver. Since Faceless Void, he's most definitely going to be the offline hero in this case, and Weaver's going to be their safe lane farmer. Weaver gives you a lot of aggressive power in the tri lane. But the only drawback with the Weaver is you have to get ahead very early on. You have to keep picking off the supports, and you have to be able to snowball off that very quickly, unless you're part of a tri core lineup. But because you've got the Faces Void, you've got him to set up for the Weaver. The Chronosphere gives Weaver all the time in the world to be able to nibble away at you. Because the biggest drawback with the Weaver is until he picks up something like a Desolator, he doesn't do enough immediate burst damage since he relies on long drawn out fights. We can constantly uh, keep running in and out of fights using the Sakuchi and dealing damage that way. Uh, Shadow Demon, as well as the Bane Elemental, being banned up by Momentum Dota, so that as Mirana's second pick, coming up from Horseman the Ruckus, doing a fantastic job in terms of the drafter's advantage, because it gives you a huge amount of flexibility. You can run Mirana's support hero, or as a core position hero, either as a safe lane farmer or in the off lane, most likely going to be UGTFO, but because they picked up the Mirana, Momentum Dota are forced to expand their next two bans on banning out heroes and synergize with Mirana. So they're forced to ban out the Shadow Demon, so you don't have that disruption into error combo, and you don't, and you ban out the Bane so you don't have to sleep into error combo, so that means that, as far as the drafting stage is concerned, and you've just forced the enemy team to waste two bands. And since UGTF has a very reliable Mirana play and you can land errors without setup, Horsemen and Ruckus are looking very strong because they've got the advantage now. They can now decide to pick up heroes uh, that are a lot more uh, powerful but are countered, so the Invoker doesn't have to worry about something like a Templar Assassin coming out or a Puck. Silencer pickup coming from Horsemen and Ruckus. If they do decide to uh, pick up 
a Templar Assassin. They've really commended all the, a lot of the all, since so many of the bands are on very powerful support heroes. Uh, Momentum Dota are at a bit of a loss for that since you can always rotate the lane and give it over to the Silencer who could break the refraction charges going for a mass co uh, max curse of the Silence build. So it could be a core position Silencer. Dumble D does like to run Rana and uh, Silencer in that one position role, and UGTFO could be the offlane Rana. But that being said, Rana also can be run as a support in conjunction with another, and so that's why you usually see the Rana SD roaming duo. Skywrath Mage, as well as the Witch Doctor being banned out by Horseman the Ruckus. And so, in return, Faces Void also gives you that flexibility since they're forced to ban out support heroes to synergize very well to Void. You don't want to deal with the Mystic Flare uh, Chronosphere combo, and you don't want to deal with the uh, Chronosphere into the Death Ward. And so, by banning out those two, you can't ban out all the heroes that go well with Void just because his ultimate uh, sets up so many heroes. And so, they're going, going for the Ancient Apparitions, you can set up the Ice Blast using the Chronosphere. There's also the Lich available, who could use the Chain Frost when you're stuck in the Chronosphere. It's a pretty uh, old school but very tried and true. Ability. The only drawback with that is the AA. He's a very greedy support. He gives you zero uh, anti-pushing power or pushing power. The only thing he really gives you is a lot of damage. Since there's Cold Feet, is a, is a fairly unreliable uh, CC ability. You need another hero to set it up. And so far, unless you're going to expend the Chronosphere to ensure the Cold Feet lands, it's not really going to be too effective. So Ancient Apparition, most likely going to be maxing out the Chilling Touch. The advantage of the AA, and the reason why he usually is picked up, especially uh, even with or without the Face of Void, is the fact that the Chilling Touch with the Weaver is an obscenely powerful combo. Unfortunately, uh, the Gemini attack won't proc the secondary hit of the uh, Chilling Touch, but the fact that you that you give Weaver what he lacks, which is an initial burst of damage, makes Weaver very powerful, since with that Sakuchi, he's guaranteed to be able to get multiple hits off in the early engagement. So if you Clash Tribe, you try, Weaver suddenly becomes very powerful. Darkseid pickup coming from Horseman the Ruckus. So we could be seeing a support position runner, unless it's gonna be a core position runner and a support silencer. So they've got that flexibility with those two, but just based off their players and what heroes they prefer to play, Yuji TFO, could be we could be seeing actually a uh, gaps over on the offlane and usually TFO gonna be playing that support Mirana since he's the most experienced Mirana player on the team. King Killer and Dumble D also can play Mirana, but they're most likely gonna be playing the silencer and the invoker respectively. And so Momentum Dota will be interesting to see what their fourth pickup is. They've only just now started to dip into their reserve time, so they have been making fairly quick decisions. But the drawback of that is they've left their uh, draft fairly open. Because they fought, they waste, they expended so many bands on the Mirana. And so Shadow Shaman being picked up, so the Mass Open Wards as well as the Ice Blast. AA Shadow Shaman, well, it is a very powerful support duo if you get levels and farm. They are incredibly greedy. Shadow Shaman, he has to go boots at one, especially now that you have the AA. Since if he doesn't, you're not guaranteed to get the Shackle off. If you can't get the Shackle off, if you can't get uh, secure kills for the Weaver, then the entire tri lane falls apart. Because if your GTFO plays it safe, if he has a safety ward, and with that point in the leap, he can constantly ensure that he's never called out. The Shadow Shaman, he's got a very slow movement speed, and Shackle, while it does have 600 range, Mirana can turn around and leap before you get, you're able to jump him, especially with the safety ward up. So, fifth band coming up from Horseman the Ruckus. will be interesting to see what hero they decide to ban out. I would suggest the Templar Assassin band, since you want to ensure that Invoker has an easy lane. And Templar Assassin is one of those heroes that if, you, if you're up against a, a mid matchup where they can't break multiple instances of your refraction, you are going to single handedly win that lane. And once you win that lane, you start to snowball. Out of control. Templar Assassin, very powerful snowballing here, but they instead ban out the Undyne. And so, fearing the mass team fight coming out from Horseman the Ruckus, just because Undyne, he works very well against lineups that don't have a lot of uh, anti push. They've got Mirana's uh, Star Storm as well as Darkseer's Ion Shell, but uh, Mirana probably going to be going for a lot of more points in the arrow early on. Star Storm does chew through a huge amount of mana. And the advantage of the Undyne, especially if the face is void, is the Chronosphere helps set up the tomb. And so you get multiple uh, zombies off before the fight even starts, or at the very start of a fight. Undying also can be run as a fairly uh, powerful offlane. You can run the face of Void mid against Invoker. This is something that 5IP like to do. Rubik Band coming out from Momentum Dota. So that's just to ensure that the Faces Void's Chronosphere won't be stolen. Since there's the Faces Void as well as the Weaver. So those are two excellent heroes for the Rubik. Since if Rubik steals a Kuchi, it's very difficult to kill him. So Kuchi gives you a huge amount of mobility and it also makes you invisible with the unit walking. And Faces Void, you're going to be almost guaranteed to uh, steal Chrono unless his Faceless Void jumps you. Since Faceless Void, he's only got two abilities, he has to leap to set up the Chrono. And so he, um, and even if he does Chrono then leap, his cast point's long enough that Ruby can usually steal the Chrono Sphere. Sand King coming out from Horseman of Ruckus, so they're countering greedy support with greedy support. The drawback with these two supports, the Shadow Shaman and the Sand King, is while they are very powerful, and they do scale uh, very well into the later stages of the game, so they're relevant in all stages, they're very, very weak at level 1 and level 2 unless you're able to uh, get boots to ensure the initiate and so Shadow Shaman will be interesting to see if they decide to do this because the drawback of it if you have a, a two greedy supports and one of the supports has to go boots that means the other support has to pick up the slag by the smoke by the wards as well as possibly the sentries if you want to deward the uh, safety ward coming out from the offlaner and we're going to be seeing a death prophet coming out from let's get it so death prophet up against invoker in a vacuum 
Uh, Death Prophet should be able to handily win the lane at level 1 and level 2, and he absolutely, the Death Prophet absolutely has to, because if Let's Get It isn't able to control King Killer, and once King Killer gets that second point of Exalt, he actually now has more base damage than the Death Prophet, because well, the Death Prophet will have a, about a 1 or 2 point damage difference in her favor, especially if he goes for the Null Talisman. Death Prophet has a horrible uh, front swing, whereas Invoker, he's got one of the better animations of the game. His attack point, I believe, is 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, so lets him be able to quite handily out-CS the Death Prophet. So we're going to introduce the players from both teams over in Horseman the Ruckus. Gat's going to be the offlane darks here. King Killer running to the mid lane as what looks like a course Exalt Invoker. He hasn't chosen his regen yet, but most likely will be the Exalt build coming up from King Killer. Since he doesn't like playing for the going for course works, and against a Death Prophet, you're forced to go Exalt. Method Man going to be on his favorite hero, the Sand King, as the 5 position. Yuji TFO going to be the 4 position runner, although in this case, because you have a Sand King, Sand King takes one priority, so you can ensure you can get an early blink up on him. So until he gets a blink, uh, he's going to be the 4 position. Yuji TFO will be the 5 as what looks like the uh, rotating runner. And Dumbledee over in the uh, safe lane, gonna be the silencer. We could also be seeing potentially a jungle Darkseer, but because he's got that safety ward, he's heading over to the top lane, so most likely gonna be the off laner. Darkseer has that advantage of being able to rotate to the jungle if things get a bit too hot, since he's a very greedy off laner, he needs a lot of levels to be effective. And over for Momentum Dota, we've got Pontan gonna be the carry player up on the Weaver, running to the safe lane. Jesus on the Goon Sack gonna be the Ancient Apparition. And Stand in Big Boy gonna be uh, that Shadow Shaman, so he's gonna be the five the four position of the AA being the five respectively. Let's get it, gonna be the mid lane as the Death Prophet, stacking as many stats as possible to give himself a lot of base damage to work with. Null Talisman, uh, two tangos being pulled by the supports, as well as two GG branches to give himself the maximum amount of base damage so you can ensure that he can win the lane at 1 and 2. And GS Donkey gonna be the offlane faces void, very similar item build coming up from him, as well as on Gats. And Faces Void, he's one of the few offlaners that you don't necessarily have to go boots in one. It, you still can go boots in one if you want to play super safe. But because you've got uh, the Time Walk as well as the excellent uh, level 1 stats, it's very difficult to be able to kill him off. And Shadow Shaman actually going for a Magic Stick as opposed to any other useful support item. Just a huge, greatly disagree with this build. You only go for a Magic Stick if you're one of the core position heroes and if you're up against a certain matchup, so a Batrider or the Bristleback. Otherwise, it's a waste of gold. That's 200 gold that you could have picked up with a few CS. You need to get boots up ASAP, especially in the Shadow Shaman, if you want to kill Darks here. Gats, so long, with that safety ward up, even though he placed a very conventional safety ward, if they had a center and they placed it right there, since usually the safety ward's around this area, you can instantly deward it out. And Ancient Apparition, GS on the Goon Sack, could be going for it, but while I say that, in the mid lane, let's get it, caught up by the arrow, Bar Strike now flies up from Method Man, and King Killer gets a very easy first blood, they're actually uh, hanging back to ensure he gets that last hit, and King Killer, he's off to a great start. With that first blood, he, he's got the EXP advantage as well as the gold advantage now. Since Invoker, especially if you go across Exalt, you don't necessarily have to go for Bolt. You can just to ensure that you get rune control, but you don't really need it just because uh, you've got the cross regent to give yourself all the sustainability in the world, and you're not really going to be burning through too much mana. Arrow flies out again! Let's get it! It's another 5 second arrow! Use your TFO, Mirana's one of the signature heroes, and for good reason, the ODR1. And the ODR2 has mostly been playing the Clockwork Goblin, King Killer, standing tall off against Let's Get It, Let's Get It. Unfortunately, Use your TFO wasn't able to rotate in time, so it's just a harassment arrow. The King Killer throws out a few right clicks. He knows that he could trade harass very effectively just because he's got the Quas regen to be able to sustain himself, especially now that he's going to be picking up level 3. So he'll be getting that a point over in Quas. Or he could choose to go for a second point in the Exalt to ensure that he's able to LCS. Uh, the Death Prophet and Geo Stonky over in the bottom lane being zoned up by Method Man. Method Man's now pulling back a bit to be able to uh, deny creeps. And Silenter does very well against the Faces Void, since if you curse him, he, he's only got one ability to burn off the curse, and that's the Time Walk, and that's going to tear out more mana. Once you're out of mana, the curse does a lot of damage, especially if you max it. But Silencer, Dumbledore, he likes to actually forego curse altogether. He goes for one point in the Glaive to give him all harass, max out last word, and he goes for a lot of early points and stats. And so the rationale behind it is Silencer, because if so long as you're alive in fights, you're stealing intelligence. And when you steal intelligence, just with the orb, you do a huge amount of damage, especially since Silencer now has three Agi Growth. And so he goes for more of a carry build on the Silencer, where you rely on just being very beefy and being an outlast enemy team. Especially since Silencer, if he's able to get a good global silence off, he could turn the tide. Gats turned into a pig, but unfortunately Shadow Shaman wasn't able to close the distance in time to go for a Shackle. Even if he did, I don't think he'd have enough kill power. Especially since Spawntail was still farming up the wave. Using TFO, using his illusion to scale up double damage rune over in the bottom <coughs> uh, part of the map. King Killer in the mid lane. Actually, he's starting to get out CS now, because he's being quite handily out CS by Let's Get It. And so now that he's got that second point up the Exalt, he should be able to start out CSing the Death Prophet. And so Death Prophet, they needed to ensure that uh, King Killer was able to get that first blood to have to give him an easy lane. This is Death Prophet with the Crypt Swarm. Uh, she was always able to uh, find CS as well as harass him, but King Killer playing uh, back to ensure that the Crypt Swarm won't be able to hit him as well. So you want to ensure that you always hit the enemy hero as well as a creep. If you could get one to uh, last hits with it and hit the enemy hero, you always throw the Swarm. So that's how you win the lane as a Death Prophet. That's why you're so heavily dependent 
on having a good early start since you have to get your bottle up ASAP and you have to rely on uh, maintaining rune control which you can do quite handily with the witchcraft and it gives you movement speed and also decreases the amount of cost of your, excess of your uh, crypt swarm so it makes it a lot more efficient for you to throw out. Method Man Still continuing to zone out GS Donkey, since GS Donkey, every time he eats the last word, he's going to be disarmed as well. And so it's the added benefit of having the silencer as your safe lane carry. But if you ever do leave him alone, up against the Faces Void, and Faces Void hits 6, Faces Void can go for a solo kill. And so GS Donkey, he's just biding his time. He knows that he's not meant to really find that much farm, he just has to survive and find levels. And once he gets levels, he can set up the rest of his team. Because the Faces Void, Mass Serpent Ward, and a Death Prophet Exorcism combo, there's enough for you to be able to win you these fights if you can get a good Chronosphere off especially when you group up as five. But the advantage of the lineup coming up from Horseman the Ruckus is you've got that Global Sun to interrupt. A Pontail going very deep to kill off Gats. Gats only has one point up in the surge at the moment. Chilling Touch flew out a bit too late, and so it actually didn't really do all too much. And in the meanwhile, King Killer gets a free kill over on the Death Prophet. Actually, it looks like uh, UGTFO helped out with the arrow as his mana was used up for a bit. But he's got clarities. Double damage has been picked up by him since King Killer doesn't necessarily need the runes. And the cross Exile and Vocus Sun become very scary. When those arrows land, you now have the added benefit of the Sun Strike, and that's going to do a huge amount of damage. And Method Man looks like he's actually using Burrow Strike to farm, so not being quite so mono efficient. He's trying to uh, clear through the jungle in order to find his farms. The advantage of the Sand King is if your uh, three lanes don't need supports to constantly be there to uh, babysit or the bodyguard, you can just rotate into the jungle and make good use of it. Same uh, fashion to the Crystal Man. Let's get it! Just barely whips the arrow. As he uh, heads back in time, UGTFO, if he's a uh, Death Prophet hadn't moved, that would have hit him. Faith Fruit's already up on King Killer. He does like going for phase boots on the Quas Exile Invoker, since without the points and wax, you are very slow. Usually, if you go for the Quas Exile Invoker, you just stick with regular boots or tranquil boots, used to be the norm. Nowadays, phase boots is uh, picked up on the Quas Exile Invoker because you're not really, unless you're going for the Yule Scepter, or even if you do go for the Yule Scepter, because it does mitigate your biggest weakness as the Quas Exile, which is your slow movement speed. Since Invoker is a very slow hero, he's entirely dependent on uh, the Wex regen to give him the movement speed, so he can uh, engage and disengage at will in these fights. And Gat over in the offlane has actually been having a fairly good time. He's doing a lot better than GS Donkey just because he's got the Radiant uh, offlane advantage. But actually, GS Donkey's got a lot more experience than he does. So he's got the level advantage. So Gat, he needs to find more farm. He's going to hit level 5 now. But he actually, he's caught off the Shackle. So he could be going for a kill attempt up on them. Pawn Town. He's pushing forward. Level 2, uh, level 1 Surge flying out. Actually, opted for an early point vacuum. You usually see 2 points in Surge. But if you could get away with 1 point in Surge, then go by all means, go for it. It helps you out. King Killer with a Meatball over on. Uh, let's get it. Sunstrike flies on. Unfortunately, Sunstrike whiffs. And let's get it. Actually, gets a very easy kill on King Killer. And that now gives him control of the lane. King Killer's actually starting to out CS. Let's get it. And let's get it with those 2 deaths. And that 1 kill is able to, able to start uh, leveraging himself back into a good position. Since in terms of net worth, he still is behind, but it's a lot, much closer gap now from, with that kill. And Dumbledore boots up on him. GS Donkey kind of approached Creep Wave without eating the last word as well as a few uh, glaives. And so he's probably going to be the mech carrier for his team. Uh, unless the Darkseer opts to go for it, but Darkseer with the way that he's been farming, you probably want to get an earlier blink up on him. To ensure that he could get these uh, good Virus Strike Epicenter combinations off, especially with the Chaos Meteor, since Chaos Meteor does a huge amount of damage. So if King Killer actually opted for the uh, Cold Snap, might have actually been a go for a kill, but that makes him a bit more dependent on the Sun Strike damage. GS Donkey being zoned out quite handedly. And Dumbledore, he does like to go for a Treads into Drums when he goes for this build as opposed to the mech. And if Gats is able to pick up the mech, then that means that King Kill that uh, Dumbledore can instead focus on much more uh, mid game carry oriented items. King Killer, without death, he does pick up a magic stick just because he knows that the Death Prophet's always going to be spamming out the Crypt Swarm to push out the wave and to get a bit of harass. So you might as well get a little bit in return, so the extra HP and the mana could be a difference maker, especially if you're going for a clutch blaze. And Global Science being used to ensure Gats gets out. But with the Sakushi coming off cooldown, Portal's going to commit for this, especially with that Chilling Touch, and that should be a death over on Gats. Gats actually uses the level 1 vacuum to pull him back, and Sunstrike flies out! Great plays coming off a horse with the rocks, the arrow catches on, on Big Boy, UTFO gets an easy kill. As he rotates, at the right, he was at the right place at the right time, catches out Shadow Shaman and dove a little bit too deep, and good turnaround play coming out from Horseman and Ruckus. The coordination coming out from them has improved significantly since the last ODL. So they've been playing together for about six months now, so they're starting to get a good feel for what each other uh, is good at. So Dumbledore over in the safe lane, continuing to farm up the storm. He does this every single time because he's if you give him a hero that can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against the offlaner, he doesn't have to worry about anything because he can win the lane 1v1. He's got excellent uh, lane control mechanics. And his skill as a player, he's used to playing in the mid lane, so he's used to winning 1v1 matchups. And when you have an advantage already going in your hands, Death Prophet, as well as the uh, JS Donkey, they're rotating to mid lane. He actually reveals himself. Could have gone for a gank on King Killer, but he didn't know if supports were there. As this is the advantage of having a self sufficient uh, safe lane farmer, is you can, your supports, you never know where they are. Arrow flies out from UCF, unfortunately, whips. And let's get it, he backs off in time once again. UGTFO is now being pinged out, so he's going to be a little bit careful. Especially since GS Donkey was uh, hanging around earlier, but he's rotated down to the jungle. Hey, Sarun, 
That's why they're about using TFO. He's going to hold on to it. He might pick it up later on. We've got a pen coming out. It looks like Method Man went in. Looks like he actually might have. Oh, never mind. He didn't use the mana for the bar strikes. Hacer has been picked up by UGTFO. GS Donkey rotating over to the top lane. But he's been spotted. He actually could turn on UGTFO with the Chronosphere. And he decides to do so. Chronosphere pops. GS Donkey unfortunately went for a max backtrack build. So that's actually not going to give him enough killing power on his own. But uh, the face of what is able to bring it up with a little bit of help from Big Boy. That game comes out. Sandstorm as well as the bar strike. Big Boy's going to be taking a fall from King Killer. He just wipes him up. And the Deafening Blast cleans up at GS Donkey. Let's get it. Actually, should, should be to get a kill over on Gats. King Killer fleeing for his life as well. Pawn out with the Sukuchi. Throws out the Swarm. Swarm unfortunately misses. And he's Sukuchi forward. But Arrow flies out. Unfortunately, just barely with some pawns out. If that catch, that would be another turnaround kill. Let's get it. It's one more hit. And King Killer, hiding through the trees. He's got Salve. He's actually got two. So he's Salve himself up. And the Death Prophet doesn't want to die this guy. Especially with Cold Snap. He doesn't know Cold Snap up. Since with the Cold Snap, with the Tower to Aggro as well as the Sun Strike, it could actually be a turnaround. But the max backtrack build coming from GS Donkey, you want to go back to this? It's This is the worst build you could go for an offlane void. You either go for max time walk or you go for max time walk. Max backtrack gives you absolutely nothing. No one cares if you're alive. All you have to do is get a chrono and kill them in the chrono. You never want to build survivability, uh, focus on survivability as the face of void because you're, you're not playing as a one position. You're not playing old school Dota where you play full protect one, where you have to stay alive at all costs. And then you, the current meta game, when you do pick up void, especially when you're in the offlane, so long as you get a good chronosphere off. That's all that matters. So you either go for a max point in the time walk to ensure that you can reliably initiate from a, a, from far away to get a good chronosphere off for your team, or you, if you're doing fairly well or breaking even in your offlane, then you max the time walk. So that gives you a lot of solo killing power, so you don't have to rely on supports rotating or having somebody else there. So every time you see someone in the zone, you walk in your chronosphere, and with the double damage that you get from the time lock when they're in the chronosphere, you've got enough damage just based off attack speed to go for these solo kills. But Dumble D, he's got to be very careful. He's actually caught up as Big Boy turns around Shackles, and Dumble D actually threw a Glade before that happened. GS Donkey is disarmed, so he's just standing there looking pretty. But he time walks for a very short range time, where you always time walk in front of them to body block. That would have been sure the cold feet landed. And GS Donkey now out of position. Sunstrike's going to be able to finish him off. Global Science drops from Dumble D. He steals some intelligence. Big Boy, he's running for his life as Dumble D. He hits like a truck. And he might actually be able to all walk him down. Arrow flies, unfortunately, misses. Turns him into a ram. But Method Man's got Bar Strike coming up cooldown very shortly. He uses it to get the kill. Actually, it looks like Silencer got it. So Dumble D able to clean it up. He just stands his ground and right clicks him. That's the advantage of the stats heavy build on the Silencers. It makes him very tanky. They weren't expecting that. They thought the Silencer would be a lot weaker. And Silencer, just with stats, right clicks very hard. Just because at 25% of his intelligence is coming out as pure damage, actually, it's at 30% now. And so he's, he's dealing a huge amount of damage. Especially since Silencer, uh, the uh, Shadow Shaman doesn't have any armor. He's got about 2 armor at level 1. Yeah, there you go. So level 4 is agi growth isn't good enough for him to have much armor. He's got 2 armor to work with. And so considering the fact that pure damage completely ignores it, so the glaive, the extra damage from the glaive is ignoring his armor. And plus the, the original damage coming out from the silencer with all the stats he has, that's a fair amount of damage coming out from him. And Method Man, he's actually constantly been rotating defensively as well as offensively, so he's always been in the right place at the right time. Him and UGTFO both. The supports from HOR... They're always able to uh, come arrive at the nick of time to their help out the teammates. Drums is now up on him. So 11 minutes, treads, drums, as well as the Bassy. Looks like uh, Gats opted for an early point in wall, so he's going for a, a very early uh, fighting build coming up in the dark. So you usually see two points in the surge. But the disadvantage, the advantage of this build is it means you can fight a lot earlier. The disadvantage is you usually want two points in surge to ensure that you are able to escape. And But since he's only taken one death, and it did take a lot of resources to bring him down, This the advantage of this build is it means you can fight a lot earlier. But... The uh, wall coming up from Darks here is on the same line as Raises Eye of the Storm. You only go, you usually want to completely skip it to level 10, level 11, so you can get the second point up ASAP, because the first point is very inefficient. It looks like Gats is going for the uh, mechanics. We've got a quick pause coming up from Dumble D. And he'll be having that mech up fairly soon. I do talk about Darks here being a very greedy offlane hero, because he needs a fair amount of gold and experience to be effective, because you have to have the Darks build a mech and get that mech fairly early on. Then you need him to build a Blink Dagger. And the issue with the Darks here is he doesn't really have much ganking power. Unless if the enemy supports are very low and you happen to catch them out, low in terms of levels. If they don't have boots up, you can just burn them down with the ion shell as well as with the surge. But since Darkstail, you want level 4 uh, vacuum before you really want to fight. You want level 2 points up in your uh, wall. You really can't fight with a Darkstail or fight 5v5 until you're level 10, level 11. And so if you're able to shut them down, or if you're able to... You're not able to give him all too much. Actually, just talking goes very far, and even though he doesn't have the time, the corner spare, and King Killer just stars all over him with the meatball. Definitely blast push it back, and let's get it. Let's get it. Does have that Yule Scepter? Never mind. Looks like King Killer. That's King Killer's Yule Scepter. Uses it to keep himself alive. Method Man comes with the Burn Strike. Let's get it. Forced to use Exorcism aggressively, but he's not actually able to accomplish anything with that. And so that means that one of the towers is going to stay alive for a minute and a half longer. Method Man just is using his Sandstorm. He's not really too afraid. Century one now being forced out by Juice on the Goon Sack. And he's actually able to get a family of creep damage. Usually a phone hanging around waiting in the wings. 
Actually, opting to go for early points in the Star Storm, when you're playing that 4 position or 5 position runner, you usually opt to completely skip Star Storm, just because it chews through so much money, and it really isn't all too effective, unless you can get a double Star Storm until level 3, level 4. But the advantage of this build is if Rana is able to find levels, it makes you a lot more uh, aggressive in these fights because it gives you a huge amount of AoE damage. But otherwise you usually opt for the second point in Leap, and then you just max out the arrow. Because you want to max out the arrow because it gives you the biggest bang for your buck. It gives you a huge increase in damage once it's maxed out. A maxed out arrow can do potentially 460 magic damage if you hit it at a long enough range that the bonus damage procs. Looks like we've got another quick pause, but we're on pausing now. Going to take a quick look at the gold experience graph. 4,000 gold in favor of Horseman the Ruckus. While I say that, GS Dunkish goes in with the global sun's coming from Double E. Stands his ground. He actually might be the guy to kill over in the Shadow Shaman, and he does. He might be. He'll force out the Chronosphere coming from GS Donkey if he wants to kill him. It's on cooldown. One second. King kills there. Throws out the Cold Sound. He actually jukes out the Chronosphere, and GS Donkey, he wasted the Chronosphere. The sun's charge coming out from him. It actually is enough to be the guy to kill. Unfortunately, the backtrack is there. And so having the extra, the extra three points in the backtrack. Did ensure that he lived, but it meant that the Shadow Shaman just died as Dumbledore. To stand his ground, that's the advantage of having the stats heavy built, is you can stand your ground and just right click him down. So the enemy players, aren't, they're not expecting that. The Shadow Shaman's used, you're used to uh, the Silence running away because he is such a squishy hero. The Ice Blast does a lot of work, but unfortunately, they need a bit more follow up to go for that kill. Next, spend a lot of resources in exchange for nothing. So without that Chronosphere and without the Exorcism, Momentum Dodo, even though the Lunas is built around 5 Manning, and uh, take, winning these early fights, because they've expanded those spells, they've given Horseman and Ruckus a 2 minute window, before they could group up and fight again. And when you give them a window, a horseman of records have got the Sperry late game lineup as well. It makes it very difficult. Sunstrike, Yule Scepter as well as the Meatball. Let's get it. Should be taken for air, unfortunately, whips. The King Killer should just be a right click him down. UGTFO leaps in, uses the Star Storm to clean him up. And King Killer playing a very safe, runs up. So unfortunately, the arrow didn't connect as the Defting Blast pushed them forward and then uh, the Draft Rifle ran up. So UGTFO is with the last few arrows, but he still has been fairly on point. Just with the fact that he's constantly rotating, placing uh, pressure. So even if he's. Even if the um, runner doesn't land these errors, the fact that she's always missing makes the enemy mid play very conservatively, because you, you never want to overextend. And it means that the enemy supports also have to play very afraid. Every time they try to dive a tower, they're going to be taking a lot of gas. The Ice Blast is actually almost enough to be able to kill him. I think he should just barely survive. He needed one more tick of damage for it to be enough to kill him. But at least forces him out of the lane. He's about 500 gold off his mech, and once he gets that mech, things become very scary for Horseman the Ruckus, as that 5 man becomes a lot more powerful. And especially with Sanking, he's got an arcane boots up on him, 14 minutes in the game, so in terms of net worth, Sanking is actually very rich. He's actually got 50% more net worth than the offlane face of Void, who's got absolutely nothing. This is where the max backtrack build gives you nothing. When, you, when you're this far behind, uh, since you're level 8, if you went for a max time walk or max time lock build, with the max time lock build, if you catch a sport hero out, you can at least go for solo kills. And with the max time walk build, even if you can't do anything else in terms of a uh, goal, in terms of damage, just the fact that you can set up the ult can be enough. So EG's Universe, famous for this, there are multiple games in, in the TI main event, as well as during the world card, where he was the lowest level in the team and he had the least amount of farm. But because he had the maxed out time walk and the maxed out and the chronosphere available uh, very early on, he could always reliably set up the rest of his team. And you can recover through those kills. If Faceless Void is running to the offlane, he's not able to accomplish anything in terms of CS, you have to recover through kills. While I say that, Jason Goonsack, styled by King Killers, he Yule Scepters, throws up the Chaos Meteor, will definitely blast, and then the Sunstrike as, with the Quick Invoke. I believe it does about 1300 damage at this point, so that's enough to instantly kill any hero that he catches out. Especially if he times it properly, but King Killer's been fairly on point. Usually you see uh, Cross Exile Invokers going for uh, as a hand of Midas to ensure they could get ahead in terms of levels. But King Killer, he says nuts to that, he wants to get ahead in terms of kills. They should be able to take the tail one in the top lane, they force the fortification out. King Killer, Moonlight Shadow being used by UGTF further, give him a bit of covering fire. If he wants to run it, looks like he's going for the Aghanim Scepter. So Aghanim Scepter on the Cross Exile Invoker, the reason why you build it is it gives you a massive amount of burst damage. Arrow flies out, hit point down square in the face, 5 seconds. Sunstrike flies as well as the Cold Snap to ensure he can't get the time off. So Global Sun's coming in as well. GS Donkey has Corona Spare, but he called up in the silence. Gats pulls him back in with the backing, walks out, and UGTFO is there. He might be forced to use the Corona Spare defensively once again, because otherwise he's going to be taking a fall. Can kill one more right click coming up from him, and that should be enough to clean him up. No backtrack to this time. And this offlane void hasn't accomplished anything. This is the disadvantage when a lot of teams try to copy the meta that they see in TI and in a lot of competitive games is you have to be able to execute it properly. Death Ball, this is the thing that everyone seems to forget about Death Ball, it's entirely based on execution. If you can't execute Death Ball, there's no point in drafting Death Ball heroes, because you have a very limited timing window. You've got 20 minutes to win the game, or put yourself in a good enough position that you can win the game. If you don't do that, you're screwed. Almost any other lineup, if you make it past, if you lose the, other, the first 20 minutes of the game because you lose your lanes, will be able to beat that Death Ball lineup. And while you have great team fight, they're using their ultimates on their own. They're not grouping up as five, they're not going for smoke pickoffs. The face of Void skilled completely wrong, opting for points and backtrack, which gives him absolutely nothing since he's the lowest uh, net worth. Shadow, he's only got one more, uh, 100 more net worth 
Then the Shadow Shaman, who's had absolutely nothing. He's got four deaths to his name as well. Looks like it's gonna be five. As a meatball, no definitely blast this time, not even needed. Cats with the Ion Shell that they clean up as well. The Ion Shell has great synergy with the uh, Cold Snaps and it ensures that all, every single instance of Cold Snap will prop. Just because it deals so many instances of damage in such quick succession. And so it's a very nasty combo to use. Which does give the Dark Skin a lot more ganking potential if the Invoker's with them. Ice Blast flies on too, but they're not really too fast. Mech was used prior, and they've got enough HP that Momentum can't really defend this. Let's get it, and Pawn Town, they're doing the best thing that they can do, which is to split push. Even though they're, they're, they're meant to be the ones grouping up, when you're behind, you split push. When the enemy's stronger than you, you split, to force them to divide his forces. Method Man actually called out the Grave Silence. Crypt Pawn flies up from me, he's actually been throwing his life away, so let's get it. Shows off his new uh, Yule Scepter, hiding the Sand Strike. And <laughs> the uh, Sandstorm, actually with the Sunstrike, actually gets a retaliatory kill. It's a good recognition coming out from the boys in uh, Horseman of the Ruckus, as the Sunstrike came out as well as the Burrow Strike. And so Sand King more than happy to throw his life away in exchange for a kill on their mid lane. And Gats should be the clean up that uh, top tier 2 King Killer gets it, so he's, he should be having his Aghanim Scepter about 400 more gold. He's looking very scary since. Invoker, when you go for the Aghanim Scepter build, once you hit level 17, that's when you've reached your peak. Because that's when you got your level 4 Invoke. So you've got the 2 second cooldown for the Invoke, you also have enough points in your primary regen, which in this case is the Exhort, that your combo does obscene amount of damage. And so he's got that value point of Wex to uh, not only give him access to the Deafening Blast, which helps set up his combo, but also to give him Ghost Walk, if, in case he has to play it very defensively. But with the Yule Scepter, as well as the fact that he deals such a huge amount of damage with the Exhort, Invoke is right clicking about 160 per right click, and considering the fact that the supports, both the Ancient Apparition and the Shadow Shaman, have very low armor, you can just right click them down and stand your ground. Use your TFO, leaps up while eats the Crypt Swamp, so good recognition coming up from him. Let's get it. Actually, Yule's up a creep, so he's taking the same lines as iPro87 and signing the use of abilities on creeps. Arrow as well as the Deafening Blast and the Meatball, and GG Boy runs into it and burns to death in that Chaos Meteor. King Killer sets up two kills. No idea why the Shadow Shaman ran into that. He should have ran the hell the other way. Dumble Lee going for a stat spell, now opting for a second point in the Glaives, and he's incredibly tanky. Looks like he's already got a Mystic stuff up, so he's actually going to, if he goes for a Sheepstick, he'll be having it up in about 800 more gold. And when the Silencer has this many stats, it's hitting this hard, and has a Sheepstick, if he catches a single hero now, he could kill them. So in terms of net worth, we've got a huge uh, influx of gold over in favor of the boys in the Horseman of the Ruckus. As Invoker leading the scoreboard, 9,600, we've got about 12,000 gold lead going in favor of Horseman of the Ruckus. And about 12,000 EXP lead, and Momentum Dota, their Momentum based lineup didn't get any friction. They didn't get any traction, there's too much friction now for them to be able to fight effectively as 5. They can't fight as 5 now, they have to split push, but when they split push, they're going to get caught out. Because you've got the Moonlight Shadow to be able to help set up these easy ganks. You've got the Blink Dagger coming online on Sankey, he's got it now. So you can't actually go out on your own, because you don't have Blinks on your team to be able to react defensively. The only hero that could go out on his own and try to be safe as the Weaver, but the Silencer completely destroys the Weaver, because you press R, he can't time-lapse. If he can't time-lapse, it's like Corner Space recommended. Gats could be taken full. Chief expanded as well, coming out from Big Boy. And he actually stands ground, could actually go for a kill tap without back, he gets a kill on one. Actually, might be a kill on two, he does die to the uh, Shadow debuff. But he's able to at least get a retaliatory kill, and actually force it back GS Donkey. He almost got a kill on GS Donkey. If the Sunstrike was available, was able to land, looks like King Killer. Actually went for a combo elsewhere. If that was able to latch, it would have been another kill. Method Man with that Envis Rune, scouting out, he actually could go for a solo kill and let's get it. If he Barrow Strikes and, then, and Shift Qs with, and uh, Shift Rs with the Epicenter, so that right as the uh, the stun comes off, the Epicenter comes in, so he can't interrupt it with the Great Silence or the Yule Scepter, he could actually go for a kill attempt and let's get it. Let's get it, can Yule Cyclone herself up? But with the Sun Strike available from the Invoker, I believe it's available, yeah, you should have enough damage to go for a kill. You don't even need to expend the Epicenter, I think. With the Barrow Strike and the Sun Strike, you've got enough damage. And GS Donkey. Going for the Mask of Madness, but Mask of Madness when you're playing from behind as a face of Void gives you absolutely nothing because you're not going to deal enough damage in the Chronosphere to kill them. The only reason you pick a face of Void is to ensure the, that every time you Chrono you get a kill. And so that's why you draft supports that work well with the face of Void, so that every time you Chrono you're able to win a fight because you start at 4v5 or 3v5. If the face of Void is completely behind and isn't able to achieve these great Chronos, then the other two support has become useless as well, because the Shadow Shaman, when you play Shadow Shaman from behind against a Blink Initiator, you're going to die every single fight before you get your abilities off. It actually opts to max out Shackles as well, Jesus and the Guntag dies to the Epicenter Pulses. Looks like a <laughs> UGTFO is able to get skilled out, kill another kill as well, Space is Morgan's blown up, let's get it, runs in and dies. And so Shadow Shaman gone for a completely unconventional build, you don't do this in games uh, for good reason, because the Shackle is completely useless this game. If you Shackle one, the other heroes will just kill you, especially when you're playing this far behind, you need that max out Ether Shock to give you damage. Opting, or at least, if you, because if you go for this build, you're going to die before you get a full duration shackle off. I mean, you, good luck even getting a 2 second sh shackle off, especially with the teammates there. Every time you shackle, you're eating a Sunstrike, and that Sunstrike's going to take out almost all your life. They're pinging out Roshan now, so boys and the Horsemen, the Ruckus, 14,000 gold lead in favor, looks like 15,000, as well as the EXP lead, going, going to about 14,000. If they take Roshan, it's another 1,000 gold going in their favor, so things are looking very grim for Momentum Dota. 
Especially since that death ball lineup never had a chance to come online. They lost all three lanes decisively. Gats, even though he took a death, was still able to actually find a fair amount of farm. And because the Dark Sister Syndergaard is so well with that lineup, because you've got the Global Silence and you've got the Vacuum into the Meatball, as well as the Deafening Blast. Deafening Blast is the, is the best non-ultimate CC ability in the game. It pushes back, it, it stuns, and it also it disarms afterwards for a very long time. It's an incredibly overpowered ability. The only reason why it's balanced, or the only way to balance it, is the fact that you need points in all three regions for it to really be effective. Let's get it. Runs into the Ice Wall, and so he's incredibly snared. Throws out Crypto on Pawn actually gets a kill over and run in the back line. Looks like over in the top lane, he could actually go for a kill on Gats as well. But choosing to play at Save Pontail, he's a saving grace for his team. He's got Lincoln Spare up, so he's able to fight. But while I say that, Lincoln Spare only over on Dumble D. Dumble D stands his ground though. It looks like he. I don't think he's got the Aegis. No, he's got the Aegis, so he doesn't really care. He's got the Sheepstick up as well. Big Boy caught out with the last one as well as the Barrister coming out from Method Man. Maple completely whips it, goes over his corpse. Dumble D just stands his ground. He can just farm up the wards if he wants to. And GS Donkey, once again, he was able to set up the kill on Dumble D. At least he burned off the Aegis. And so that actually was a fairly effective trade because they also were able to get the kill on the top lane with Pontown. So any trade's a good trade at this point for momentum, so long as they don't get, they don't lose five for one. If they're able to get some kind of like trade that's even remotely close to even, it works out for them. Just because they're so far behind. Sheep as well as the last one to ensure he's disarmed. And GS Donkey couldn't even time walk out in time. Dumble D stands his ground, so right click, let's get it down. Actually, he's going to be very careful, he's very low now, and the Shadow Debuff is enough to be able to bring him down very quickly. As let's get out with the Exorcism, is very scary, you still have to respect the Death Prophet. King Killer gets caught out, and the throw is coming out from Horseman the Ruckus. As they just fed a huge amount of gold, as there's two sprees that were ended. So about 15,000 gold lead now, once the gold graph clears. But the experience lead is dropping much more uh, lower, so about 13,000 experience lead. In terms of net worth, they still are very far ahead, but Weaver Pawn Town, despite the rest of his team doing fairly poorly, he's picked up a few kills. And the Weaver is very effective against the Mirana because Mirana relies on either being a land errors, on small errors, or heroes that are playing aggressive against her, or being in a leap away. And Weaver, you should, it's very difficult to land an error on the Weaver if the Weaver is playing correctly because you can secure you to be able to juke off the side since it gives you max movement speed. And you can run down the Mirana since Mirana relies entirely on leap for a survivability. If you can run out, if you can run out the leap, then Mirana is very easy. And that you also have to purge off the haste run, so you are going to be taking a death. Especially with Pontown, they should be able to get the last hit, unless the Let's get the Ghost for Actually jumps into the neutrals to try to deny himself, but with the bug on them, that wasn't going to happen anyway. And let Death Prophet is able to kill him with the Grip Swarm. So the boys from Horseman are getting a little bit cocky. Darkseer, yeah, Gats probably going, going towards the Shiva's Guard, since with the Vacuum, Shiva's Guard's a fantastic pickup on the Darkseer. It makes you very hard to kill. And since with the Darkseer, if you can get a wall vacuum off, it doesn't matter if uh, you die right afterwards. As long as you're able to get the vacuum wall off, it doesn't really matter. Since that usually does enough on its own to be able to win you these fights. And so the Shiva's Guard gives you a massive increase in survivability, so it makes it very difficult for them to kill you uh, if they use all their spells on you, especially since the Exorcism is physical damage, and so the armor coming up from that's good. Or if Darkseid decides to go for a Sheep Stick, having an extra Sheep is never a bad thing. Sheep's a 3.5 second hex. And it's one of the best items in the game, especially if you can pick it up on a, a non carry hero or one of your uh, utility cores. Actually, on some heroes that have a lot of damage built into them, like the Klings or the Yasa, Sheep Stick actually gives you a much more a higher increase in damage and damage items because it gives you 3.5 seconds where you can just smack him around as well as disabling evasion. Dumble D going to go turn the top against Pawn Town, burns off the, the Lincoln Spell at the last word, catches him out the Sheep Stick, and it's going to force out the uh, time lapse. Then when you use the Global Sun to commit to this, he should be able to get the last hit. And while that happens, King Killer cleans up Jesus on the Goon Sack, his Ancient Apparition, absolute food. We've got a 25 minute, 26 minute Mask of Madness coming out from GS Donkey as he has been completely useless this game. The one upside you have is you've got the Exorcism with the Chronosphere, but even then, if you, if you don't catch out King Killer, he will kill everybody else on the team. He can pretty much go 1v5 at this point, especially since he's now transitioning to for a zoo build. So with the Aghanim Scepter up, and with the, the 6 points up in uh, the Exort regen, he deals obscene amounts of damage. And with that Necronomicon, Necronomicon works very well with the Invoker, because you've got the double Forge Spirits, so you, it ensures that you reliably uh, constantly stun lock targets with the Cold Snap. But with the Necronomicon minions, the Necro 3 units actually deal more damage than most heroes. Because the Necronomicon Warrior, uh, burns off 75 mana each hit, so actually the damage stacks up very quickly, and the ranged unit, the archer, has the mana burn, which you could use three times with the uh, duration, and so even if you only get it once or twice, it's a huge increase in burst damage, especially with the cold snap locking in place, since he's got four points up in the quest region, so it's about 28 damage per cold snap, not as powerful as it used to be, definitely the reason why Invoker has fallen out of favor, is because he's lost all semblance of lane control, so that's why you always see him, you usually see him in the safe lane in the competitive scene, because you you can't play from behind when you're an invoker, you have to be ahead or at least break even. Pawn Town gonna eat an arrow after the sheep, Gats running very far forward, Ice Blast unfortunately whiffs on him, he gets turned into a pig, but the epicenter bar strike from Method Man catches out too, let's get it. BKB, so he does have his core items up, but he's already lost almost all his HP, so popping a BKB reactively when you're that low HP, 
The only reason why I survived is because I chose not to commit for that. That's your 10 second BKB wasted. First set of racks. Going in favor of the boys from Horseman and Ruckus. And GS Donkey. Not even there to help defend. If it was Pontel, I can understand because he can split push very quickly. But the faceless void, you need faceless void for the Kronos, but that's the only reason. Uh, the only way you can try to recover this game. Let's get it. Quite out the error. And the meatball let it clean up. Actually goes all over his corpse. And Dumble D, huge amount of intelligence all up on him, 16. <coughs> and with that cheap stick, he's the only obscene amount of damage. He's got 3.6k, and with the huge point of amount of stats in, as well as that maxed out glaive, he's dealing mass amounts of damage in these fights. He's dealing about 300 per right click. And since a good, about half of that is pure damage, he has, he's able to about 3 4 shot your Shadow Shaman. King Killer uses the uh, Yule Scepter to actually set up the Ice Wall. Ice Wall's a fantastic deck because it goes through BKB. GS Donkey vacuum back in, good vacuum as it catches up too. Big Boy also takes a fall. Method Man actually just blinked into the trees, just standing there. He's got the blink available, blinks in for the Sandstorm, just for the bad mana plays. He could have even gone for the Burrow Strike. The Chronosphere actually sets up a kill on huge TFO, as well as maybe King Killer. King Killer could be taken for. He stands ground, turns around the Tornado, very short range Tornado. He uses Cyclones himself to keep himself alive. Pontown goes in for him, he's able to get the kill, but the Sentry Wall's been dropped. Gats drops the wall, no vacuum available. Stands the ground against Dumble D. Dumble D, don't know why he turned around for that. And the Burrow Strike from Method Man shows a kill. He, if he just continued running, he would have at least made it out. And he ended a fairly big spree. And Voka buys back into the game, two racks is down. In terms of net worth, in terms of gold lead, we've got about 21,000 gold lead. Going in favor of Horseman and Ruckus. Let's get it run through the wall. Wants to really get a kill over on Gats. He's not going to get it. And now he's going to throw his life away. Method Man, as well as Silencer, get a kill on the back line. Ultra kill going in favor of Dumble D. He wants to get a rampage. GG's being called. 29 minutes into the game. Momentum Dota get completely destroyed by Horseman and the Ruckus. As the biggest drawback with the Death Ball lineup is you can't play from behind. You have to be ahead. And that's what happens when you lose all three lanes. So we're going to be taking a quick break, I'll be right back to game number two, stay tuned.